online and here in the sanctuary. Welcome to worship with Trinity Reformed Church. We are a community God gathers, transforms, and sends to share Christ's expansive love with the world. If you're new to Trinity, we invite you to scan the QR code in your order of worship. You can sign up for the weekly email that way or with a welcome card at the Welcome Center. A few announcements to highlight this morning. The first is that it's a potluck Sunday. All are welcome to head downstairs after worship to share a meal of world foods. There are extra plates and utensils available for you if you need them. And it's always helpful and appreciated if a few people volunteer to stay to the very end and help with cleanup after the meal. Uh, there is no ultimate Frisbee today. There's an announcement in the bulletin that uh, survived the editing process, so no ultimate today. A guide to Trinity's fall book, Rooted, is available at the Welcome Center. We invite you to pick that up today or whenever you want to. Finally, next Sunday, Hope College professor Stephen Bama Prediger will be with us to lead our second hour session. He's entitled that time, What on Earth Can We Do? Caring for Creation in Your Own Backyard. I hope you'll be able to stay and experience that second hour next Sunday. Now, let's center ourselves for worship today by singing the first three verses of Brother Sun, Sister Moon. The song is in our melon-colored booklets. Brother Sun, Sister Moon, your light shines. From the heavens, giving glory, giving glory to the Maker. Gentle wind, welcome home. You've been traveling with your song. Singing glory, all the glory to the Maker. Alleluia, Alleluia, sing glory. you to rise in body or spirit as God calls us to worship. Today we have gathered in worship and we see that the cycles of life continue. We have been given the duty to live in balance and harmony with each other and all living things. 
So now we bring our minds together as one, as we give greetings and thanks to each other as people. Together we say, now, now our, our minds, minds are one. one. We give thanks to all the waters of the world for quenching our thirst and providing us with strength. Water is life. We know its power in many forms, waterfalls and rain, mists and streams, rivers and oceans. With one mind, we greet and thank the waters. Together we say, now, now our minds are one. Now we turn to all the fish life in the water. They were instructed to cleanse and purify the water. They also give themselves to us as food. We are grateful that we can still find pure water. With one mind, we greet and thank the fish of the water. Together we say, now our minds are one. Now we turn our thoughts to the creator and send greetings and thanks for all the gifts of creation. Everything we need to live a good life is here on this mother earth. For all the love that is still around us, we gather our minds together as one and send our choicest words of greetings and thanks to the creator. Together we say, now, now our, our minds, minds are one. Now we'll sing our gathering song number 521 in our red hymnals, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who was and is and will come again. And all God's people said, Amen. I invite you to be seated. God's grace is ever flowing to us. We wade into that grace whenever we offer a prayer of confession. So let's confess our sins now, confident in God's ability and willingness to wash us clean. God of all creation, you have made us in your image and blessed us. Yet we go our own way, causing harm to ourselves, to one another, and to the earth. We confess that we have been thoughtless and greedy with your gifts. We have polluted our rivers with poisons. We have treated our streams as waste dumps. We have turned living waters into death traps. 
We have wasted precious waters in luxury living. Forgive us, O God, we pray. Children of God, having confessed our sin, hear this good news. Jesus Christ, the one who is seated on the throne, says, See, I am making all things new. In Christ we are forgiven. Believe this good news and live in its peace. And may the peace of Christ be with you. Let's share a sign of that peace with one another. Good morning, friends. Will you help me sing our prayer for illumination? Be still and know that God is here. Be still and know that God is here. Be still. Today's a special day at church. Does anybody know what we're celebrating today? We talked about it, right? Any guesses? Today is World Communion Sunday. So this on this day, most churches in the world celebrate communion. Am I encountered? Da, da, da. Sit on your bottom. Some churches, like ours, celebrate communion. Every Sunday, right? We get to do communion every Sunday. And some churches have communion once a month. Some churches do communion just four times a year. But this is a Sunday when almost all of the churches all over the world from many different cultures will have communion. That's pretty cool, isn't it? It's cool to think that while we take communion today, people in churches all over the world are having communion too. It's a reminder to us that we are all members of God's family. What are the items that we use when we take communion? Esther, give me one. Bread. Yep. Juice. You got it. We use something else when we do communion. What else do we use here? Hand sanitizer. Yep. (laughs) Connor. Yep, the juice represents the blood. You're right. 
the story. Yep. Liturgy. Huh? Yep, to represent the blood that came from Jesus. You're right. And what did Pastor Ben pour this morning that splashed out? Water. Yep, you, you remember our baptism, right? So today, I brought something special for you. And these are some different breads from different parts of the world. So that's why we use hand sanitizer when you sat down. Um, so you get to try some different things. Now, these are not necessarily what they would use for communion. It's just bread from different parts of the world. So the first one that I have for you, this is called non bread. You've got flat bread. This is what it looks like when it's not cut up. You had that last night. <laughs> Very good. Um, and this comes from India or Southeast Asia. So you can take a peek to try. This good? What do we think about that? Good? All right, the next one that I have for you to try, this is something I've never tried. This is called frisk bread, and it comes from Sweden. It sounds gross. It's kind of like a cracker. It comes from Sweden and Finland. It's really flat. Try a piece of that. It doesn't look like bread, does it? <laughs> Very different than what, what you're used to. What do we think about that one? Not, Not your favorite? <laughs> it is like a cracker bread. All right, the next one that I have for you to try, see if you know what this is. Tortilla, where do tortillas come from? <laughs> we use tortillas a lot, don't we? That's like Mexico, tortillas come from Mexico. You wanna try a tortilla? Yeah, you put tacos on tortillas? Try one now. How do we feel about the tortillas? They're okay. They'd be better if they, were, if they had something else. All right, and the last one I have for you to try today, this is from the Netherlands, and it is called breakfast honey cake. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty good. That's not honey. Which one was your favorite? That one, the last one. <laughs> it's kind of what I figured. That's why I saved it for last. How did I get all the bread? Well, I went to Meyer and <laughs> looked for bread from different parts of the world, and there's an international aisle that had some, too. Um, the last one is your favorite. Yes, um, interesting. I wonder, are there any countries or places that you'd like to pray for today? India. India, all right. Kansas, that's for you. Ukraine. Disney World, all right. <laughs> Praying for each other is a great way to care for one another. So let's pray together now. Can you guys hold your hands and close your eyes? God, thank you so much for World Communion Sunday. Today, we pray especially for our friends in India and Kansas and the Ukraine and Disney World. Help us to remember that we are all your children and are loved by you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our song of preparation is number 520 in our red hymnals, Jesus, We Are Here. We'll sing this in all three languages and re then repeat the fourth verse in English. Uh... 
Our first reading this morning comes from Psalm 104. We'll read verse 1 and then verses 5 through 16. You can find that on page 483 of our Sanctuary Bibles. Let us listen now for the word of God. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You set the earth on its foundations so that it shall never be shaken. You cover it with the deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. At your rebuke, they flee. At the sound of your thunder, they take to flight. They rose up to the mountains, ran down to the valleys, to the place that you appointed for them. You set a boundary that they may not pass so that they might not again cover the earth. You make springs gush forth in the valleys. They flow between the hills, giving drink to every wild animal. The wild asses quench their thirst. By the streams, the birds of the air have their habitation. They sing among the branches. From your lofty abode, you water the mountains. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your work. You cause the grass to grow for the cattle and plants for people to use, to bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the human heart, oil to make the face shine, and bread to strengthen the human heart. The trees of the Lord are watered abundantly, the cedars of Lebanon that he planted. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Our second reading comes from the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 47. We'll read verses 1 through 12. That's on page 714 of our Sanctuary Bibles. In this text, the prophet Ezekiel is in a vision with a mysterious divine guide showing him the way. Then he brought me back to the entrance of the temple. There, water was flowing from below the threshold of the temple toward the east, for the temple faced east. And the water was flowing down from below the south end of the threshold of the temple, south of the altar. Then he brought me out by way of the north gate and led me around on the outside of the outer gate that faces toward the east, and the water was coming out on the south side. Going on eastward with a cord in his hand, the man measured 1,000 cubits and then led me through the water, and it was ankle deep. Again, he measured 1,000 and led me through the water, and it was knee deep. Again, he measured 1,000 and led me through the water, and it was up to the waist. Again, he measured 1,000, and it was a river that I could not cross. For the water had risen, it was deep enough to swim in, a river that could not be crossed. He said to me, mortal, have you seen this? Then he led me back along the bank of the river. As I came back, I saw on the bank of the river a great many trees on the one side and on the other. He said to me, this water flows toward the eastern region and goes down into the Arabah. And when it enters the sea, the sea of stagnant waters, 
the water will become fresh. Wherever the river goes, every living creature that swarms will live. And there will be very many fish once these waters reach there. It will become fresh and everything will live where the river goes. People will stand fishing beside the sea from Angeti to Eneglam. It will be a place for the spreading of nets. Its fish will be of a great many kinds, like the fish of the great sea. But its swamps and marshes will not become fresh. They are to be left for salt. On the banks, on both sides of the river, there will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither, nor their fruit fail, but they will bear fresh fruit every month because the water for them flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves for healing. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. In the early 1800s, On the land we now call home, the local Adawa tribe leader, Chief Blackbird, lived in what we now call the Black Hills neighborhood, a prominent piece of land in the Grand River floodplain that overlooks the final reach of the Plaster Creek before it joins the Grand River. One of Grand Rapids' earliest mayors, Charles Belknap, recorded a disagreement between Chief Blackbird and a local missionary about the best place to encounter God. Chief Blackbird maintained that his people worshiped the Great Spirit outside, and he thought it odd that this missionary was trying to convince the chief's people to come inside a building and look for God in a book. So one day, Chief Blackbird and the missionary traveled together in a small boat up the Kinoche Creek until they reached a beautiful waterfall pouring over a large, colorful outcrop of gypsum. And Chief Blackbird explained to the missionary that he and his people met God in sacred places like this one. I wonder if the notion of God's people meeting with God at a river felt familiar to that Christian missionary. When we read the story of scripture, rivers are particularly sacred places. All the way back in Eden, it was a river that God used to water that holy garden. It was in crossing the waters of the Jordan River that God's people moved from the wilderness to the promised land and entered into their new life. It was in that same Jordan River that John baptized men and women as a sign of their repentance. And all throughout scripture, we have pictures like the one we read from the Psalms this morning of God's rushing water going forth to provide sustenance and life for all of creation. The prophet Ezekiel, would have surely recognized the presence of God in a river. Ezekiel isn't a prophet we hear from that often in our worship together. His prophecies don't come up often in our lectionary, but the visions Ezekiel receives and records are incredibly vivid and compelling. Ezekiel was a priest who lived and ministered during the Babylonian exile. The first portion of the book of Ezekiel takes place before the Babylonian invasion. And so the prophet proclaims God's judgment against the people's wickedness and calls them to repent. But they don't. And so the later portions of the book then happen after Ezekiel and many other high-ranking Israelites were taken from their home and forced to live under Babylonian rule. In the second portion of the book of Ezekiel, the prophecies are different. Here, Ezekiel speaks to his fellow exiles, sharing the visions he's received. Visions that speak of a new hope yet to come. A time when Israel and the temple will be restored, when what has gone wrong will be made right. It's in that section of the book of Ezekiel that we find the vision we read together this morning. A vision that harkens all the way back 
to Genesis 2, when the Garden of Eden is watered by an ever-expanding river. In this vision, Ezekiel's guide brings him to the entrance of the temple at the highest point in the capital city of Jerusalem. Now, at this point in history, the temple has almost certainly been destroyed, but in the vision, the temple is renewed. And there, at the threshold of the temple entrance, water is flowing from below the temple itself. It's not a raging river, it's a trickle. Did you know that in Wisconsin they call drinking fountains bubblers? Did you? (laughs) I really liked that when I lived in Wisconsin. I thought it was a great description of what the water looks like in a drinking fountain. That's what we have here at the entrance to the temple, just a trickle of water bubbling up. Then the guide takes Ezekiel all the way around outside the gates of the temple, and they find that trickle of water again. It's not much water, but it's persistent enough that it isn't just being reabsorbed into the ground. It's carving its way through the soil, out past the walls of the temple. And then the guide takes out a cord and measures a thousand cubits, maybe around 1,500 feet. And in that distance, the water has gone from a drinking fountain to a creek an ankle deep. Again, the guide measures another thousand cubits, and by this point, the river is up to Ezekiel's knees. Another thousand cubits It's a waist high, a thousand more, and the river has become so vast, it is impossible to cross. In a space of 4,000 cubits, maybe a little over a mile, this trickle has become a raging rapid. And then Ezekiel and his guide, they backtrack the distance that they have traveled, and Ezekiel sees that this riverbed is lush with trees of every kind, their fruit for food, their leaves for healing. And the guide tells Ezekiel that the water of the river flows out far beyond what they have seen, making stagnant water fresh and teeming with life and food. This trickle that begins at the temple that doesn't look like much of anything at all flows out into the world, bringing life and sustenance and healing for all. What a promise this must have been for Ezekiel living in exile. What a promise for the people of Israel removed from their homeland by their enemies promise for the world in which we still live, a world where the riverbeds and the nations and our souls bear the wounds of creation's brokenness. That day on the river when Chief Blackbird tried to open the missionary's eyes to God's presence in creation, he also inadvertently pointed the white settlers to the presence of gypsum. The settlers started mining the gypsum in order to make plaster, which is how Kinoche Creek, which means water of the walleye, became known as Plaster Creek. Pollutants from that mining process, along with logging and farming and human development over the years, degraded that creek so much that by the early 2000s, the creek carried such high bacterial loads, it was unsafe even to touch the water, let alone for it to support the walleye for which it was once named. When I was preparing this sermon, I did something that I often do. It is the deeply spiritual and theological practice of desperately asking everyone in my home, what do you think about when you think about this? So this week, the question was, what do you think about when you think about rivers? I noticed that this week in particular, the conversation was nearly identical with each person I asked. What do you think about when you think about rivers, I would say. And they would respond, water? Right, I thought that's not enough for a sermon. What's unique? 
unique about rivers? What do you think? What makes them different than other kinds of water, like puddles and lakes and oceans? They're moving, that person would say. They move in, in a direction. They go somewhere. All week long, I've been sitting with that image, water that bubbles up from the ground or collects in a hollow from the rain and carves its way downhill, always moving from here to there, joining up with other trickles and moving on. A river is relentless in its flow, moving or circumnavigating rocks and logs and soil in its path to get where it is going, to arrive at its home. Plaster Creek is about 27 miles long, with a watershed of about 58 square miles in the cities of Grand Rapids, East Grand Rapids, and Kentwood, and the townships of Ada, Cascade, Caledonia, Gaines, and Grand Rapids. So most of us live in a city or township that includes the Plaster Creek watershed. All of this water from Plaster Creek flows into the Grand River near downtown Grand Rapids, and from there it continues its journey westward, arriving in Lake Michigan in Grand Haven. Now, as is typical with environmental degradation, the effects in Plaster Creek are most powerfully felt by low-income communities that live downstream and receive the brunt of the pollution and the flooding. For many reasons, including environmental injustice, many of these downstream communities are at higher risk of cancer and other respiratory and neurological diseases. The relentless movement of the river means that what happens at one point in the river will necessarily impact those along the river's path. The river of environmental degradation is seen in the effects of mining pollutants and stormwater runoff and pesticides. And yet, we can see in Ezekiel's vision that the relentless movement of a river can give us a glimpse of hope as well. What begins as nothing but a trickle at the temple with time and distance and motion, becomes a river of blessing to the nations, bringing restoration to all creation. This is the potential power of a river. And a group of faculty and staff and students at Calvin University are joining in seeking to embody Wendell Berry's instruction to do unto those downstream as you would have your upstream neighbor do to you, the Plaster Creek stewards work with schools and churches and community partners, seeking to restore the health and beauty of the watershed of Plaster Creek. Through research and education and hands-on restoration, they are joining with the spirit to renew Plaster Creek all of creation. What is true of the river's degradation can also be true of the river's restoration. That the movement of the Spirit of God and of God's people, seemingly at times small and insignificant, will not be damned. What begins as just a trickle at the temple continues on as a sprinkling or a dunking in the baptismal waters. It joins with the white caps of the Spirit's movement over time and ends in a flood of grace that washes creation clean and makes all things new in Christ. So I wonder today, I wonder how we might join in the relentless movement of the river of God. I wonder how you might change your habits to lessen the degradation of the earth's rivers. I wonder how you might live in ways that show love to your downstream neighbor. 
how might we be swept away by the relentless movement of the Spirit, that we might join in the flow of the river to the reign of our God. Let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the way you are always moving and moving us. May we join in your river, flowing to justice and peace and healing for all of creation. Amen. I invite you to rise in body or in spirit for our song of response. It's in your order of worship. Let's sing together, May the Love of God. you to be seated. Our great prayer of Thanksgiving can be found in our melon-colored resource booklets. If this is your first time celebrating communion with us, you may simply follow those around you as we come forward to receive the elements. If you wish to remain in your seat, raise a hand and a server will bring them to you. Most importantly, know that all who seek to follow Jesus are welcome at this meal. Let's begin our great prayer of Thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Christ, you became embodied in the world, 
to redeem all that you have made. Send your spirit upon us now that this bread and cup, the fruits of the earth, may be to us the body and blood of Christ. At supper with his disciples, Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, broke it, and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After they had eaten, Christ took the cup. And he gave it to them, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Great is the hope of all creation in Christ. Hope of the ends of the earth, our terror and war you will cease, and even the distant nations will come to marvel and share. This is the bread of life given for us. Let all who hunger come and eat. This is the fruit of the vine poured out for us. Let, Let all who thirst come and drink. These are the gifts of God for all of creation. Let us come now for all things are ready. Joy like a fountain 
Having been fed at God's table, we offer a prayer of gratitude and intercession. God of the rivers, as one who gathers waters, thank you for bringing us together at this table. Through seed transformed into bread and grapes transformed into juice, you quench our deepest thirst, making us one with you, with each other, and with all of your creation. In gratitude for this meal formed from the waters of life, we give you our offerings. Use them and us, we pray, for the good of all the earth. Oh God, we give you thanks for all the rivers of the earth, from the vast expanse of the Amazon to the comparatively tiny Plaster Creek. You move water over the face of the earth, sustaining life, allowing creatures to navigate vast distances and reshaping the land. In the ceaseless flow of water, we see your dynamic presence. In the patience of water, we see the perseverance of your love. In the way water refreshes, purifies, and sustains, we see Christ as our living water. Guide us to protect the rivers of the earth, leaving room for them to flow and flood. Lead us to restore vegetation along streams so that waters are shaded and sheltered. Help us to do unto those downstream as we would have those upstream do unto us. God of the rivers, hear our prayer. We pray for the people who live in tents along the banks of the Grand River. They see the beauty of misty mornings and feel the coldness and danger of being alone at night. We pray for safety and for opportunities for all those without a home. Make our political policies and nonprofit agencies helpful to those who by choice or necessity camp along the river. God of the rivers, hear our prayer. We pray for justice to roll on like a mighty river and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Continue to break through the dam of a U.S. government polarization and lead legislators to govern with care for the next months and the next decades. Resolve workers' strikes in ways that are just and far-sighted. Flood the people of Ukraine with fresh energy and resolve. Carry them to deliverance and peace. Lift up people oppressed by totalitarian regimes so that freedom beyond their imagination becomes the expectation for their children. Your waters do flow over every land, connecting all people. Help us even now to live as one in Christ. God of the rivers, hear our prayer. We give you thanks for the new life your rivers bring. We thank you for the birth of Fred Oliver and Baby Fox Webb. Bless their young lives and help their parents as they recover from delivery and discover new family rhythms. We thank you that John Caterberg is back home and back with us today and ask your blessing on him as he rests and adjusts the new meds. Help Janice Lodge and Jane Zavadil as they continue to recover from their surgeries away from home. Give them what they need in this season and the wisdom to know what to seek next. We thank you for bringing Joy Larink through surgery without any major complications. Continue to bless her with healing, rest, and peace. God, you know the needs of all those on our hearts. We ask your love to flow out and touch these people in any place of loss, pain, or confusion that holds down their spirits. God of the rivers, hear our prayer. God, thank you for gathering us like water here today. Help us to join with your mighty rivers in giving life to this land and its peoples, in giving habitat to fish and crustaceans, and in giving drink to the birds of the air. God of the rivers, hear our prayer. Amen. Now I invite you to rise in body or spirit as we sing Thirst No More, which is in our order of worship. Is 
head out. First, you're invited downstairs to the Fellowship Hall for a potluck after worship. And second, there's one more song to sing after the benediction, so don't leave too quick. Now I invite you to raise your hands as a sign of our unity in Christ. As we go from this place baptized into God's holy river, we go with God's blessing. May the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen. All you people join the song. 